Smoke 2013 has a very typical editorial workflow if you are familiar with other NLEs that are available on the market. We have our media library along the left where I have already imported my files and I have them organized in individual folders. I have my UI set up to my source and my sequence view. By default, Smoke will give you a sequence based on the format and resolution settings you created your project in. If you want to create a new sequence, you can go to the File menu, choose New, and choose New Sequence. The New Sequence dialog box will open where you'll access all the parameters such as resolution, aspect ratio, bit depth, and so on. You can also name your sequence on the top field. Once you have your settings correct and you are ready to start to edit in that new sequence, choose Create and a new sequence will be created and added into the currently selected folder. If you want to reorganize any of your media or your sequences, you can do so by just picking them up and dragging and dropping them into different folders. In the lower part of the editing panel, you can have as many sequences open as you want. You'll always have access to one source file. In this case, it's the same sequence that I have currently selected. You'll see the tab with the green highlight in the background. The sequences are always highlighted with a red bar along the top of the tab. As I select any sequence in my folders, you'll notice that the tab in the back with the green highlight is changing as well as the file that is being displayed inside the source viewer. To bring this tab forward, I just click on it and now I have access to the original source media and its audio. To bring a sequence back to front, just click on the tab and it will be brought forth and focused. You can close any of the sequence tabs by clicking on the little X that appears when you bring your cursor over that tab. So as mentioned earlier, Smoke has your typical insert, override, and replace workflow for building a creative edit inside of your sequence. For example, if I select a file inside of the media library, it is now displayed inside of my source viewer. I can click the play button to start the playback. When I want to create an in point, I can click the in marker and the in marker is now set. When I want to create my out mark, I hit the out and the out is set and I can stop my playback. You can scrub the playback of your source media if needed by grabbing the yellow time indicator or by dragging inside of the time code field itself. Now that I have my in and my out marked for this source, I would like to edit this clip into my sequence. Over here, you'll see three buttons representing the most typical editing functions you perform on a daily basis. The yellow button is the insert, the red is the overwrite, and the blue by default is the replace, but there's also a little arrow just to the right of that. If you click this, you'll see you receive several other options such as align edit, append, prepend, ripple replace, replace media, and fit to fill. These can be accessed from this flyout. I'll choose insert by clicking on the yellow button and now you'll see the media with the designated in and out marks have been inserted into my timeline. Now I'll select another file in the media list and do the same thing. I'll start my playback. I'll hit my in point. Wait to the point where I want my out mark and I hit my out mark and I stop the playback. Also notice that you have these time code fields below and next to the in and out and duration. These could be used to also alter and change your in and out markers. You can click in any one of these to receive a calculator to enter a designated time code or frame depending on your setup for your in, your out, or the duration setting. I'll click the insert button once again and this clip has now been brought in. I'll zoom back a little bit by clicking and dragging on the horizontal scroll bar and then scroll over to see the two clips that I've just inserted. I can now scrub my clips and look at the edit that I've created. I'll insert one more clip, so let me select another file, I'll hit the play button once again, and again just as before, I'll set my in point, and I'll wait to the point where I want my out, and I'll set the out, and I'll stop the playback. Now if I bring my cursor to the cut point, first of all notice that it snapped that cut point. That's because snap is on. If snap is not on, obviously, I'm not going to snap to the cut point, but with snap enabled, and I drag and scrub, it will snap to the cut point. Now if I choose my insert option, the yellow button, once again, you'll notice what happens. The footage that was after that rippled down in the sequence and my new clip was inserted into the location based on the in and outs and where my positioner was. Let me undo that very quickly by going to the edit menu. 
This time I'll use the overwrite button, which is the red middle button. You'll see what happens. The duration did not extend, the clip at the end did not ripple, and the frames from the original clip that were in the timeline were now overridden based upon the in and outs of the clip that I just used the overwrite function on. I'll undo that one more time with Command Z, and I'll choose the insert option once again. Notice that the audio is being inserted or overridden as I perform my editing tasks. If I would like to edit some media into my timeline, into my sequence, without the audio, there's a couple methods to perform this. First, on the patch panel for my audio in my sequence, I have a lock button. When I enable the lock option, you'll now see this overlay of lines indicating that this track, this audio track, is now locked. If I navigate to the last frame of the last clip on my sequence, I select another file, quickly set an in point, I'll scrub forward and I'll set an out point. And now if I use any of my editorial tools, you'll notice that the audio is not brought in, even though if I go to the tab for that source clip, you'll see there is audio in that file. Let me go back to my sequence and I'll undo that once again. I will disable the lock option for my audio. And this time I'll go back to the tab for my source and I'll lock the audio there we see the same indication that the audio is now locked for this source. Back on the Sequence tab, I click the Insert once again, I get the same result as when I had the Lock option here. Because we locked the audio on the source file, when I use my Insert or Override or Replace buttons, the audio is not being brought into my sequence. Besides using the lock option inside of the patch panel, you can also just click where it reads A1 period L for the audio layer, and it will disconnect the audio from being affected with the edit. To re-enable the audio, just click once again where it reads A1 period L, and your audio layer is connected once again and will be affected by the edit. You can also drag and drop your files directly from the media library into your sequence. For example, once again, select another clip, scrub to a point, I want my in, I set my in, scrub forward, I set my out. This clip is now prepped and ready for me to bring it into my timeline. Instead of using my editorial buttons, I will pick up the clip and bring it into the sequence area. And you'll notice that there is a visual representation of what is about to happen. It's telling me that I'm about to insert this video clip and the audio. I release and you'll see that is exactly what just happened. The reason why we saw a yellow indication being in insert mode was because Ripple was on. Let me undo that, Command Z, turn Ripple off. I'll take that same clip, I drag and drop it into here, and you'll notice now I have a red representation of what is about to happen. That is because Ripple is off and we are now in override mode. And if I release this, you're going to see that it's going to override any media I drop on it and the ripple effect does not take place because ripple was obviously off. The same rules of your audio exist when you drag and drop. If the audio track is locked on a clip you are going to drag and drop in, smoke will not bring in the audio. You can see once again I get the red indication that I am in overwrite mode and I'm bringing in just the video. Notice that if I drag this media above the existing video track where there is not a video track, it's telling me it's going to append a new track, track number two, and create that track during the drag and drop process. I release and a new video track has been created and my media source has now been added to that video track. Once you have multiple tracks inside of your timeline, be aware of the yellow crossbar that is part of our current frame positioner. This is the focus point. This is telling Smoke which layer to focus on when adding tools or using your edit function buttons. For example, I'll come to this frame right here, and if I select another clip such as this, and I quickly set some in and outs, if I use my insert, my override, or my replace button, the clip that was selected with its in and outs designated will be placed onto that layer that the focus point was at. If I bring this focus point up to the top layer that was created during the drag and drag process of this clip, and then use any one of my edit buttons again, I'll use the override once again, you'll notice the video was added to the sequence on the layer where the focus point was. Also notice that the audio overrode the existing audio on the audio track one, because it was an override. 
One last thing about dragging and dropping files from the media library into your sequence. You can obviously select multiple files in the order you want them edited in and drag and drop them down into the sequence area. And again, of course, depending upon if Ripple is on or off, the media after this insertion will have a different result. So this has been a basic introduction to the editing conventions inside Smoke 2013.